Welcome everyone to this week's data science seminar. I'm David Bader and I direct the New Jersey Institute of Technology Institute for Data Science. I'm pleased today to have Dr. Ilke Altintosh as our speaker. She's a research scientist at the Uni University of California at San Diego and the chief data science officer of the San Diego Supercomputer Center, as well as a founding fellow of the Halid Jialu Data Science Institute. She's a founding director of the Workflows for Data Science or Word Center of Excellence and the Wi-Fi Lab. The Word Center specializes in the development of methods, cyber infrastructure, and workflows for computational data science and its translation into practical applications. The Wi-Fi Lab is focused on artificial intelligence methods for an all hazards knowledge cyber infrastructure becoming a management layer from the data collection to modeling efforts and has achieved significant success in helping to manage wildfires. Since joining SDSC in 2001, she has been a principal investigator and a technical leader in a wide range of cross-disciplinary projects. With a specialty in scientific workflows, she leads collaborative teams to deliver impactful results through making computational data science work more reusable, programmable, scalable, and reproducible. Her work has been applied to many scientific and societal domains, including bioinformatics, geoinformatics, high energy physics, multi-scale biomedical science, smart cities, and smart manufacturing. Today, Dr. Altintosh is going to speak on toward a scalable computing ecosystem advancing data integrated applications for science and society. So thank you for speaking with us today. For those who have questions, you may share them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the lecture. Thank, thank you so much for having me and thank you for the great introduction. Uh, I am the director of uh, Workflows for Data Science Center of Excellence at SDSC and words, uh, Center came out of a need um, in the um, wake of the big data revolution, the way I'd like to call it. Um, I've been at uh, UCSD at the Supercomputer Center for two decades now. And the first decade was definitely about application and coordination of computing to more uh, simulation like computational science challenges. And there were a lot of data management activity as well. But suddenly uh, it grew into an area that there is a lot of influence of data in the way the science and the simulations and computing is uh, being conducted. And it was very much this collaborative new breed of science that's very question oriented. And it required integrating all kinds of things together around that question. So it, along with it, I think being a workflow person came a need for a methodology and a new type of research around this team science that puts workflows in the center for collaboration. And with all the things that integrate or compose into an application. Uh, in that sense, words was after some years of doing workflow automation studies, an effort really uh, starting to bring communities together so we can solve problems together. So it's in a way uh, a very um, broad activity with some depth in areas of big data, computational science, cyber infrastructure, and it requires an ecosystem of people and things to apply these to the problems we are solving. So when we look at it that way, um, at the core, it has digital continuum and computing at that continuum and things that are possible with the data becoming available from all kinds of sources. And this combination enabled us what we now call uh, data-driven applications. And we actually talk in all kinds of disciplines, this concept of data-drivenness smart things, computer-aided things, personalized things, precision, you know, this age-old disciplines uh, and areas 
they added these things to their names that start with smart. And, you know, why is my phone a smartphone? It takes some things to be smart. But one of those is being able to turn sensing in the environment to data and communicating that data or making sense of data so that it can be communicated in service of that uh, area. So I always mention this smart diaper concept, right? You can make anything smart if you put a sensor in it and a network in it. But you know, if you put a sensor in a diaper, you can make, um, you can help <laughs> mothers or parents um, and make the baby more comfortable, right? That's like anything you can think of a smart concept that way these days, how practical and environmental it is we need to discuss. But, you know, I think that gets the points across uh, the most because it's a very simple concept, but, you know, asking ourselves why something is smart, what goes into it is very important in solving the problems with data. So it definitely brings data drivenness and some sort of heterogeneity in um, how we are using data and what kind of environments data passes through and what it helps with and who are the collaborators or stakeholders doing that. But uh, when you think of a team science effort that's influenced by data, you generally think of a group of experts in different areas, but definitely driven by the goals of the domain science or application and then coming together and developing algorithms in a very exploratory way initially and often what goes on is that exploratory activity is translated into needs of scalability and and very often than not a scalable entity gets redeveloped based on the learnings so currently the way things done is that link between exploratory activity and the scalable activity is often broken. You know, then you could keep exploring, but are you going to redo? Is it the same thing who explores and scales together? You know, these concepts really become challenges to answer. And what we can do is maybe come up with environments and tools to help teams learn enough to scale while they're exploring and have middleware and other things to bridge that explore to scale gap. But at the end, some outcomes come uh, and uh, happen. And we need to, of course, understand the errors and uncertainty and other scientific accuracy uh, and validation bits coming of the outcome. But at some point, this team or a group or a domain scientist or somebody who can make that call will call this a scientific discovery and it will be published. And at that point, will that be able to be repeatable or reproducible, uh, validatable? These are challenges, definitely, the science needs to answer. But then you think of the data and computing or the digital continuum and the systems that contribute to this. Data systems is not storage and you know, some database access to data anymore. Right? It's data and knowledge management and very software driven storage that's associated to that. Um, computing is not high performance computing, high throughput computing anymore, but there's this continuum of edge to cloud to HPC and everything in between that needs to be distributed. And it's often actually used uh, in conjunction with each other to solve a problem. And connectivity is not just connecting point A to B, but also being able to connect systems in a way that serve the applications. So these are our software design or programmable networks that we are seeing with some computing capability on the network itself or with some storage capability on the network itself. So it sort of begs the question, you know, is the whole world our computing ecosystem? And I think the answer is yes. And this is the answer that's yes beyond the cloud concept. Right. It's like um, computing ecosystem of things that come together in this data networking and definitely um, heterogeneous computing bits. And there are some middleware or like conceptual technologies also that relate to areas like blockchain, artificial intelligence, internet of things, 
and edge quantum different types of architectures. And those are the disruptors. Right? And any problem that uses um, a few of these together. And when you try to make sense of it, you can make diagrams like this on the right. And you can find many of those in the on the web. But it's really the way they are being applied to different applications these days is like these wiggles. Right? There are a lot of going back and forth and thinking about how this application can take advantage of those. But there is no uh, generalizable approach at the moment that can be scaled up for use in different areas. And that formalism, I think, is needed. Um, so what kind of problems these type of disruptors helping? Any opportunities, but in science, I think the biggest opportunity is just closing the loop between observation or experimental science and simulation, and really accelerating that pace of learning through learnings from the data can we improve our understanding and simulations? That requires also at some, in some application areas, this um, dynamic data-driven science that involves streaming data and AI um, and learnings from the streaming data as dynamic as the application wants that data to be. In the societal context, we are seeing a lot of this actually, you know, when I'm in an area, can you market me something? It would be a dynamic behavior, not a day later, oh, she sometimes goes there, let's show her this. Um, similarly in science, or you know, if I'm a patient, I'd like to have a personalized treatment in the course of my disease, not after the fact or worse, after I die. Um, so, and it has a lot of need for real-time data curation, reduction, understanding, annotating the data, what it is, the knowledge generation from the data. And, you know, like at autonomous cars or autonomous systems, like having self-control in a system and making that system reactive enough um, to situations that are arising or maybe provisioning even what can happen. So, and that requires some and creates opportunities with that requirement. Some needs for coupling these different modes of computations, uh, new software and tools that includes and puts AI as a part of the activity. And whenever we think of data and self-controlling systems and reliance on this type of applications, uh, security, integrity, privacy, these become big concepts. So it's no Surprise, in that sense, responsible AI is becoming a big part of the discussion. But all of these require some form of getting value from data and as fast as possible, wherever you are. It could be, you know, my watch has some capability to process the data it's sensing so it can send me alerts. It doesn't go back to the data center, right? It's that speed and the ability of the things also themselves to do some of this activity and linking. Um, and then there's the big data and challenges of working with data. And we often hear about the V's of data. It's a nice cute acronym that means a lot of V's, but some notable ones are volume, variety, veracity, velocity. And the idea is if you handle its challenges, you'll get value out of it. But what these V's really mean is Size of the data is big, and it comes from different sources with a lot of different structures. So it's very complex to manage data from different sources. It requires different data systems and stores. Its quality is often an issue because of different sources of information. And it can come in varying rates. Its speed can change. Like in social media, one day you can have maybe 10 million tweets, and another you might have 100 million. You know, I definitely don't know these numbers. <laughs> um, so it could be tenfold. So then when you think of these challenges, there are very few people, even think of just the size, just the volume of data. There are very few people and experts and environments that can host that type of volume and big data itself and they can apply large amounts of computing to it in an optimized way. 
So if we can use this type of resources to ensure we turn that data into what I call this amplified value zone or a version of the data that tells us a little bit more about the data itself, like domain specific annotations or aggregations of data in a way that uh, lower the dimensionality of the data into more useful forms with some metrics, with some measures of uncertainty and things like that. Um, we can then ensure others who can't normally have access to the data in its raw and large form that requires scalable computing to teach with it, to use it in different applications, to commoditize looking at the data. You can have, for instance, in this case, raw image data. And if you turn it into thumbnails with enough understanding and annotations of what's in the detailed data that I got from a microscope, you can have a lot more people look at those thumbnails. And if they need it, they can also download the high resolution version. So that's really commoditizing the data in a way that you can use it in different contexts. And suddenly, that high value zone helps us in that sense to generate further action using the data. So in many areas, we are seeing this linking data to a form and serving that form to communities in an open, transparent fashion, enabling different types of applications. And where does AI live here? In the middle. Do you need some form of AI, machine learning, or understanding uh, knowledge integration, semantic annotation, all those bits that we roughly refer to as AI live in the middle. You need to have some things to prepare the data so it's more valuable uh, on top of uh, big data and computing infrastructure. So then the activity that I'll mainly talk about today becomes, can we amplify the, the value of data related to any area and then serve it so it helps benefit some form of application in science, business, society, or education. And again, it goes back to the original. These things are very question driven. It's in the eye of the beholder. So we really need to focus on the problems to solve and prepare our computing and data and other types of infrastructure systems and teams to be able to serve that application, that solution that is an answer to a problem. And what are those parts? It's part data management, part data science or data analytics, um, part computational science, and part advanced infrastructure. And some gears need to be in place so I can link groups of people, questions, data to these um, different areas and create an integrated solution on top of what's available out there. So there's some tooling methodology and culture development that needs to happen for them all to serve uh, that problem solving activity. And then when you, <laughs> uh, sometimes it doesn't work, <laughs> turns out, um, then you turn that activity, okay, now it's better, into um, a translational uh, bit. Um, so basically, you put a translation activity in front of it through community engagement, through understanding of the needs, that then converts the findings in this team science effort nicely to what I call a use-inspired framework that others take can, can take advantage of it. So it's also a way of bridging science and technology to practical use, which is, I think, a a uh, nice expectation bar we need to set ourselves uh, as uh, data scientists in general. But what is this ecosystem enabling? What are the needs? What are the best practices? Data driven, as we talked about, scalability, dynamic behavior. But then when you talk about dynamic, scalable behavior, manual interaction at some point needs to leave itself to a process-driven automated, uh, pro um, automated application. But then a lot of the data science, as we know, is interactive. And you know, how do we create an environment, again, that bridges that interactive work to a process-driven automation? And can we do things 
uh, to bridge these different parts of the picture and also help heterogeneous computing and data environments to support that activity. But there are also things like team collaboration. And with that collaboration, collaboration will not happen without trust. But when we talk about trust, it needs to be metric driven. It needs to be accountability driven. We need to set expectations prior to doing something together. So we know what we are building individually is built to integrate and make a part of that process in a collaborative fashion, in a metric driven accountable fashion. And then there's the part of that reproducibility uh, as well. When you think about process drivenness, what are we saving and learning about the process? So we can validate and reproduce things and over time bring backwards compatibility to environments, decisions, and you know what we are doing as part of the data science. <laughs> um, okay, I might give up at some point. Um, so, and the biggest part of it is it includes people. Human is in the loop at every part of this. And those human beings have different types of expertise and a culture needs to grow together with that multidisciplinary expertise. So this is what I call continuous AI integration at the digital continuum. It's kind of a mindful, of a mouthful. But what it means is we need to define processes in a way that's, first of all, free from what we can do today. <laughs> it's easily said than done because we all have things to deliver, things to do, and our own dreams about uh, different uh, capabilities. But when we think about, and typically here, I'm talking about a dynamic data-driven process. There's some observed data. There's machine learning and AI related to that. And what we are observing helps us to select some interesting signs and parameterize, let's say, a simulation or an ensemble of some sort. And we learn things from that and iterate based on those learnings to reparameterize and try things. And as dynamic as uh, this process is, the more accelerated the findings will be. Then you look at the left versus right of this. Um, typically, the, on the right is a big data edge cloud or more like dynamic AI like workload. And on the downstream workflow, there is a high throughput or high performance computing like activity that has simulation and other types of physics based applications. Uh, and one part needs different capabilities and the other part needs capacity. It doesn't mean that, um, you know, AI doesn't need capacity, but definitely the capabilities I'm talking about is need processing units like um, GPUs, TPUs, or FPGAs, or edge computing, big data modeling and management environments, and you know things that serve machine learning, analytics, and that type of uh, application workloads, like inference. And on the right, it's more traditional, you know, uh, high throughput and computing uh, HPC environments. And this could go these days, as we know, uh, to exascale levels and it's definitely an important part of it. And let's put an application conceptually to this. You know, molecular dynamic simulations is a big part of many different sciences, um, like drug design and other types of areas, um, like understanding uh, the dynamics and atom, atom interactions. And there is a part of this that we can actually use imaging and learnings from the imagery to select things to learn or select interesting chemistry, so to say. It can be used to create a system of molecular dynamics to be simulated. And, you know, that begs the question of maybe we can start course and, you know, learn at the time series that, that we are getting from the time series that we are getting to get more and more detailed into it. Can we cut some computing time? 
but also can we use experimental data and learn from it and bridge that uh, interaction to prepare the data um, so that we can have a system that's very specific to what we are learning uh, from, let's say, images that are coming from electron microscopes or uh, cryo devices. When you look at this very conceptual workflow, um, you see that there is continuous data access and integration. If you were to close this loop and do it all once in a system. And there's also uh, things like GPU enabled molecular dynamics, which, which we have some, for instance, automated workflows for. Um, and clustering, deep learning, and things like Markov state optimization. So these require big data, AI, HTC, HPC, high throughput, high performance workloads. And by the way, just doing the molecular dynamics for some systems will take millions of core hours if you were to do this. So there's still a need for high capacity and capability at the supercomputing level. But something like this requires composability of different uh, systems. And you know, the, the dynamic composability is definitely the required state of um, integration here. And there is no one person who could do all parts of this. So we need to really build systems in a way, if you're building an application like this, you can integrate um, parts together. And also in a group environment, can we enhance teamwork by also using AI uh, and AI systems for actually processing and enabling a metric oriented accountable teamwork. What does it require as system pieces? And you know, this is the closest to a reference architecture, which is missing a lot of things, but you know, what we need. It's very when, important. Um, when what we need is systems that we can compose together. Um, you know, these could be computing systems, storage systems, through networks that help us also through environments that help us manage, orchestrate these resources, uh, but also services that run on these resources with some capabilities that we can learn about these runs. And then what happens is any application that runs on a computing system, it could be a simulation versus it could be an inference model can be then integrated as a part of an overall workflow. And I don't mean it as the workflow in the traditional sense, the scientific workflow of coordination of everything, but some overarching process that we can manage parts of it differently. And throughout, then you look at the yellow blocks, throughout this whole picture, there's always data and the life cycle of data, how that data is being managed, it's a very, um, dynamically managed activity. There's active data repositories, long-term archives, knowledge networks, you know, all these things are actually a part of that data lifecycle management that needs to be kept together. So it, it's not like I can now do my computing and get data out of it, put it in the storage and another thing will pick it up and I'll stage things accordingly. So it's beyond that model that there's this something that manages that life cycle across these systems and supports in an intelligent way, all these different horizontal areas. Then to make them really useful, we need the blue blocks. We need use inspired interfaces for science, education, scalable, practical, societal use, for instance, that could be maps, they could be gateways, it could be, um, environments that actually bridge use of this different services and workflows to communities. And then there's the things around team science, reproducibility and responsibility that we can't look the other way anymore. It has to be there and it has to be really accountable. And this requires some measurement. You know, we can't treat our systems like black boxes anymore. There's a queue you get on and when you're done you get your results back 
but we need to really understand system availability and compatibility of services we are running on these systems and their performance. Yes. Um, so this is, in that sense, a dream that I had over the years as we were working with different applications uh, and which all translated into such a um, reference architecture that we are trying to apply in some of the applications I'll show. And I said applications, data related to an application area to solve a problem. And what I'm gonna talk about today is some of those applications um, in the hazards domain. What are hazards? First of all, I think when the problem is hazards, you need to use it to save lives. <laughs> There's a hazard that you need to protect people and property from. And that's at the end of it. If it's not useful for that, I don't know why we are building it. And emergency management requires that continuous monitoring and integration of hazards. So it's really a dynamic activity and the nature of hazards are changing. Like we've seen in COVID, you know, we don't know our tomorrow because of that dynamic nature of that. You know, new strand comes in and does it help? You know, can we connect things through data? Can we monitor situation? Can we analyze and visualize so we can create situational awareness across the board? And can we use predictive modeling and science and systems and simulations to actually make more educated guesses at best about what will happen in a, such a dynamically changing environment? And emergency management generally has a few different phases from preparedness to mitigation to response and recovery. And, you know, some parts of it, like response, will require us to be reactive. We are responding to something that happened. But more importantly, how can we be proactive and use signs for that proactive preparedness and mitigation? Um, so that's where there are huge opportunities for bringing science to societal scale. But that requires two things. One is integrated knowledge-based management of data, cataloging, curating, all the efforts, all the simulations too. So we can exchange and analyze experiences and optimize and communicate around use of them. And the other those that goes along with it is this team science and translation, team science and translational to practice bits. You know, we need to involve communities of use in efforts that include science uh, and technology communities. And we need to learn also to respect each other while we are doing this about the needs. COVID-19, I think, gave us that big taste of what can happen, right? Um, we need a holistic approach. If one side doesn't know of the other, you know, what's the data about COVID? There's so many types of data, right? There are so many uh, disease data that we are learning from, you know, the evolution of the disease, virus models, variables. People actually have data that they can provide. Public health surveys, social media, contact data, you name it. I think we can list 100 types of data sources here. And what are the models that we are working with? Um, the science community is working with spread modeling, virus models, drug design, vaccine development. You know, these are course areas and under them, you know, many types of sciences are involved. Economical impact, mental health. You know, these are effects of COVID too and they need to be actually depending on some parts of understanding the spread. And when Professor? we get right, um, yes. Excuse me, I had a question about AI. Would you think that uh, doing a type of AI, which is uh, the self-aware AI, would solve any problem we face today? And how much and when do you think that the time will be released of a self-aware? I mean, Sophia was a theory of mind of a type of AI. I mean, they shut it down because she was like developing in the wrong path. But what do you think does self-aware um, self -aware type of AI will help us, will solve any problem we face? Well, I think self-aware, definition of that self-aware is important, right? Because what we mean by self-aware AI and if it's awareness of its own responsibility and accuracy and things like that, uh, it might 
uh, I mean, any form of AI can be made useful. And that's the application of that intelligence in a responsible way. So to me, the question we should ask is not, can it be useful? Uh, I think it's more, how can we make it useful in the context of an application? That's why I almost say, you know, what problems are we solving and can we actually optimize use of AI and bring AI into the process in a responsible way? I hope that answers the question because we Yes, thank you, Professor. Uh, I think we can't just pick one type of AI and say, this solves all the problems. And, you know, that happened with big data too, right? I got questions like, I have a Hadoop cluster and how can we use this now? <laughs> you know, is it useful or should we get a Hadoop cluster? <laughs> I'm like, so let me understand your problem. So it's a very similar situation. And you know, those applications like we've seen in COVID will come from decision support, policy making, vaccine, treatment, cure. You know, these are all areas that if we know about the left and can we use it in a way to optimize all these different decisions. So I have my lighting challenges here, but like one of the applications that uh, I was a part of here, uh, led by UCSF in collaboration with Aura and at UCSD by Professor Benjamin Smart from the Data Science Institute, um, is uh, this ring study. So Aura is a ring that can give us uh, vitals or um, physiology data about people. Their um, fever, their heart rate, sleep, and all kinds of uh, other measures of someone's uh, physiology. And it's a pretty good medical grade um, IoT device, let's call it. And the good thing about Aura is also it helps individuals have access to their own data. So it's done a bit differently compared to many other uh, measurement devices. Um, and through voluntary participation of people, they enabled this study, 70,000 plus people donated their data along with community surveys of those people. Um, so of course, through a you know data science and data environment process, this was used so then look at disease signatures. And we know to date about thousand or maybe a little more of these individuals went through COVID during the study. So you could see by looking at the data set, you know, the onset of the disease and you know what happens during, after, and if there's any changes. And this is the biggest individual level data that would be coupled, that could be coupled to societal scale um, disease models. So it creates a nice environment, a multi-scale modeling of the disease if we were to be able to couple this type of studies together. But it's a typical, at that level, this is real big data. There's survey, there's IoT data, and AI systems that's constantly processing this data for easier uh, modeling by communities in a data system. And it could be used in downstream disease models. Because some in the study even found out um, their temperature changed a little bit, not a lot, but when they took the test, they were positive. So, you know, what we call asymptomatic is not asymptomatic, it's just not symptomatic to the point of them breaking out in a really high fever. Um, so, and flu and COVID look different in the, you know, onset. Um, of the disease. So what does it take? Right? There's like multiple data systems here, something like this. There's the anonymization and secure hosting and turning that into an anonymized time scale or time series uh, data environment that's scalable and building an interface for anal analysis groups to take advantage of maybe as teams building parts of it uh, so that they can continuously analyze. And at the same time, the system can generate alerts and send it back to the doctors and things like that. So this requires an architecture that's very highly heterogeneous and highly dynamic in its needs. And that needs to be done also in an auto-scalable fashion. That auto-scale requires understanding what each analysis takes. And when I do more of it, then I can actually spawn a 
cluster using something like Kubernetes, which is a container coordination environment. Um, so I can actually ask from the computing environment uh, enough resources so I can do it for more individuals at once. So that's also the intelligence at the infrastructure level that auto scale feature. So what if it was wildfires? As I said, I'm talking to you from a um, fire station. So I've been involved in wildfires because this is a huge need in California. And in just 2020, 4% of California burned. In, um, in the West, across the Western states, it's 10 million economic damage. And last 20 years has seen 18 of the most destructive fires in history in California. So that means they're happening uh, more frequently, and they are becoming more and more distracted. Six of those were this year, last year in 2020. So, and that's a reason of a few different things. Right? Climate is changing, the way we are um, managing uh, and suppressing fires definitely builds some deficit for natural fires to happen, and it's, it's a fire adapted ecosystem, they have to happen. And we are building in the wildlife urban interface further uh, increasing human activity. So there are many reasons that are coming together and creating this perfect storm. But as a part of that, fire behavior is changing. And we need to really understand from data over time how that behavior is changing. And while it's changing, catching that and using that understanding. So that's that dynamic part again. And science-based decisions are needed because we need to be responsive and reactive, but at the same time, we need to be proactive. We need to understand what's a good fire and when we can we actually treat using science, these mitigation uh, or uh, these uh, deficit, fire deficit zones, so we can maybe decrease the destruction by fire as a result of that. And what kind of data do we need here? Weather data? because fire behavior can be modeled and there are many very vibrant actually scientific community there. Um, weather forecast and ground-based sensing data, basically weather stations, uh, fire perimeters that could be collected of course by official sources, but also through remote sensing like satellites, planes, um, drones, and firefront isn't just one thing, right? One point, it's a zone, it's an area and some direction component is there, but there's definitely a large area being burned. So following that requires a remote way of uh, understanding and looking at uh, a large area. Um, and then there's the fuel and vegetation that burns and becomes fuel in these fires, biomass in general, and the landscape information. And by using this type of data together with fire modeling in the right phase of uh, preparedness, mitigation, and response can couple science to policy and decisions uh, in these different uh, phases. So AI, there's an opportunity here, right? There's the fire science and AI that serves that fire science, but the same data and models that are built can also enable this application both reactive and proactive application, actually, in this slide, I was more talking about uh, prescribed burns and mitigation. So Wi-Fire was a system that was built for this purpose to couple the AI or data and computing to fire science and maybe also to practical use of that at that time. And it evolved in it. It was a research study to create a dynamic data-driven workflow that we can actually demonstrate and show the use. But over time, its use has been quite extensive by communities. And it also made us learn two things. You need a data sharing environment, and it doesn't exist, and model sharing environment in this domain to advance the science itself. And we also need ways to bring practical communities of use so we can create a use-inspired research to, to use AI and other optimization techniques to then create science-driven decision support. And there is, of course, research challenges in data, computing AI, and scalable workflows for integrated fire science, open science, trans 
transparent science, these are definitely research requirements, but also it requires translational expertise. You know, that team that solves that problem isn't just computing data and AI people or fire science people. It's also people who know the needs of the communities and who knows how to translate those so that we can use properly whatever we are doing in the context of a problem. So what's dynamic data-driven modeling? The activity, as I said, is about where is the fire and where will that fire go? It's direction and rate of spread. In the response sense, you need to know it right when the fire is happening in uh, prescribed burns or mitigation scenarios. You need to um, create uh, more of a detailed model of that particular environment so you can um, stay in a bounding box so this prescribed burn doesn't go and affect the community nearby you know uh, but in the end this whole activity of bringing data together with models and computing needs to be converted into something people can use on a map maybe they can create a quick model quick scenario generation or a big ensemble that takes for a few days, but then results will enable permitting for prescribed burns. You know, there's all these things that can be done once we get this area right. And Santa Ana conditions are the conditions in San Diego that we actually um, call fire weather. It's some wind direction, speed and relative humidity on a very hot day, generally coming from the desert. And there are sensors that detect uh, Santa Ana conditions, but it's very local to where the sensor is. Then can you couple that sensor information to a wind model and, you know, tile up the environment so you can actually create how this sensor area, and that requires that computing and data science techniques to stitch everything together. So then we can generate zones that are affected rather than, you know, this sensor is reading this weather. But there's a lot of topography. Is it really affecting that environment or not? Another part of this picture is field modeling, right? It's the, you know, understanding how vegetation changes. There are databases that are published by official sources every two years. But can we use maybe high resolution satellite imagery or other type of remote sensing to update them on a regular basis using LIDAR sensing through satellite imagery? And when you do something like this, it becomes, you have this highly detailed picture. This is actually a 50 centimeter resolution of the environment. And can you learn from that enough? So you can then bring together tiles that are similar and identify where the problem zones are that affect fire behavior. And then there's the fire perimeter. And there's a role for understanding dynamic weather so can you model and at the same time learn from actual fire perimeters so you can constantly adjust through checking how the model compares to the actual fire perimeter and learn that dynamic understanding of the fire's own behavior to reparameterize and run fire models. So it's this constantly learning and moving model. But where does that perimeter come from? When we started and said we will do this, all we got was a laugh. <laughs> it's because it, that type of every 15 minute fire perimeter was not heard of at the resolution. Now, when we typically look at it, there are cameras that help us see the fire, but AI for that is pretty difficult. Is this cloud or is this smoke in this image? Sometimes it's even hard for the human eye to see, but sometimes it's easy. You can look at it and know where the smoke is coming from and you can even see some hot spots in the image and at night you can definitely see the hot spots and convert that into a perimeter maybe even by one camera that you could use and geolocate uh, where the fire front is and there's satellite detections that are every six to eight hours high resolution every 15 minutes two kilometer resolution so there is a way to use all of these different modalities information to generate one truth with uncertainty thomas fire for instance on december 10th fire front was here as i mentioned fire front is some direction but it's not one location which makes it very hard to find where the fire front is and adjust to it and this area that was burning in December 10th become a part of the official orange fire perimeter. And the fire front is now here moving to Santa Barbara. 
And if you were to actually look at these satellite depictions, it almost like you'd see four weather events over the course of one and a half months. First wave, second wave, third wave, fourth wave, and fire is still happening while that's happening, uh, while that's coming. So if you know the weather is coming and account for it and model for it, maybe you can mitigate and manage differently. Like, um, so that's the part of the use of these models. And we also become part of uh, a state program since 2009. Then we now have aircraft that's prepaid by the state. But the moment the fire happens, the aircraft goes up, gives us detailed fire perimeters with some official governance and process, of course. And that gets used for that data assimilation. And actually, right now I'm here because of the 2021 planning part efforts. Um, and this one shows the fire map environment built by by fire. Um, so these are two kilometer every 15 minutes go satellite detections. And behind this actually Mount Milton Observatory. And for a while there, nobody knew with all this information, the camera is right there on the observatory and it stopped sending any signals. If the, for an overnight, nobody knew if the observatory was burned or not. So that's the risk uh, still of uh, not being able to have that much detailed information. So how do we continue to iterate and use computing for this? Um, AI is everywhere in the loop and different modes of computing is everywhere. And it becomes a workflow like this. You collect fire imagery in this particular example, get the uncertainty of that parameter and use it to parameterize a fire ensemble. And you need to integrate the modeling product and then compare you know, parameter to that modeling product on a regular basis. There are a couple of different computing environments. Sage is an AI on the edge pilot generated, but it's not funded by NSF. I just give the references here because that Sage helps us actually to put sensors out there with accelerators so we can actually learn the, from the camera itself without that camera image coming to the data center and trigger. There's an alert here. We can start modeling. Some of this is obviously experimental and not real-time useful. And then Pacific Research Platform created a network of GPUs uh, across a 10 to gigabit network called Nautilus, managed by Kubernetes. And something like this, you can actually bring through Ceph and other technologies, a cloud compatible storage. So you can couple a network of gaming GPUs, flash IO devices that can process eight node GPU devices that can be used for machine learning tasks at scale um, through cloud compatible data and networking. So it's petabytes of storage that can be achieved this way. And that would be the missing middle between computing and uh, different distributed computing environments. And of course, this model also scales to HPRN is the network we are using in San Diego back county. Uh, we could also couple this. And the last bit of it, how does HPC connect? And that's what the composable systems part of Expanse is demonstrating. We are reserving a part of the Expanse cluster for to be a Kubernetes based cluster. So it's not just Slurm, it's also a Kubernetes uh, cluster. And that can be composed with Nautilus or Sage-like environments to create a pool or a federated cluster out of these dynamic resources. And that then can be used to run a workflow across these systems with some magic on the data backend. Right? Data and storage federation is still a challenge and that's an answer that we need to have all together as a community to make that happen, of course. But I think expands Nautilus and other Kubernetes-based systems that are now actively picking applications, by the way. Uh, we are looking for applications to build um, on top of composable systems uh, through Exceed. Um, is, I think shows us to, in the future, shows us the opportunity to start now putting these concepts in and starting to link the AI systems funded by NSF with the supercomputers funded by NSF or the Sage-like uh, networks, fabric-like um, networks that help us and give us uh, distributed networking and edge capabilities. It looks like this to the user. 
even when I put it in one sentence, it's a lot to say, right? Um, and how can we enable the users? What are the research challenges? I think there are four parts, there might be more. This is the way I see the world. Dynamic system, uh, so composable systems, like heterogeneity and user applications that support dynamic behavior. How can we measure our systems so they become dynamic themselves so they can help? Like Kubernetes is one family of ecosystem that's very influential in this work that I presented, but there could be others that they'll find. How can we generate intelligence about these systems, their availability, so we can then build steering, dynamic steering and workflows and collaboration and responsible AI environments built into them. Like scientificness of things that come out of the integrated activity needs to be measurable as well. And then when we talk about data, we can't ignore knowledge. You know, when we use the data, how do we couple that to fair and responsible knowledge environments? And how do we create convergent teams that use all of this all together and create solutions? Can we train and create a culture of these multidisciplinary data scientists that actually can come into these solution based approaches and efforts and be a team player? You know, PPAS.AI is one environment we started building for this type of um, work. And smart flows is our then collecting system information that we can feed intelligence to this collaborative team environment. And we capture the team workflow in a way in a common workflow language that can be translated to any workflow execution engine. And just to conclude, I think we need a full ecosystem makeover, so to say. And I'm not suggesting we need to let go of what we already have. I think coupling that to this more data-driven applications with all the characteristics I tried to convey needs new type of thinking. Um, and it's very, I think, effective to bridge the gap. Thank you. I'm a few minutes over, maybe. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. That was a very comprehensive talk going all the way from systems to important applications like the wildfire modeling. And if anyone here has a question, please ask on the chat. And maybe I, I could ask a, a few questions to start. Uh, so um, SDSC, San Diego Supercomputing Center is going into its 36th year now. And it, there was a need for having supercomputing built out in these um, on-premises academic environments. And now we have the availability of large IT companies, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, et cetera, also supplying such services. What, what is the differentiation of need? For instance, you, you talked about systems. What is it that you need uniquely, say at SDSC, versus moving all of this data science and computation off to say AWS? Great question, right? Because there's definitely a lot of thinking we need to do in terms of justifying existence of these supercomputing um, environments. And the answer to me is of course simple because I always have the goal to embrace one size doesn't fit all. And it's very specialized computing systems. You know, there's still a part of science that pushes the boundaries of what can be done in cloud and other types of uh, resources, uh, let alone, you know, handling the expense of the activity on a regular basis. Um, I think it's a lot more expensive if you have uh, the constant, you know, full load on a supercomputer to do the same thing on just by economically, I think there's some advantage to having them. But I think for supercomputer centers, the future is being able to support all kinds of modes of computing and this heterogeneity and embrace that, 
you know, we can't run supercomputer centers the way we did before, you know, there you come and do your computation and take your data out. We need to really, you know, that yellow reference architecture I showed, we need to embrace a mode of that and solutions on top of that. So we need to couple systems and become the experts for the user community to take advantage of these different platforms. So the role is changing in a way actually that makes supercomputer centers more central to applications rather than becoming, um, you know, big iron user application environments. So I think the future is more exciting <laughs> that way. Uh, and there's a lot of room for growth in supercomputing. Thank you. There's a, a question from Philip Falcone, who asked for business continuity and crisis management, uh, how to efficiently codify or quantify very diverse information, plan systems, reports, documentation from a business to measure robustness and identify vulnerabilities. Yeah. So. That's that overarching responsibility that I tried to couple all of that because it's really impossible to mention all parts of the activity here. But it's a big part of it, right? When you have distributed environments and you're actually integrating different, um, not just blocks of things like hardware, but these are like namespaces that you're managing. So that's why, for instance, storage federation is difficult at the namespace uh, space level. Um, I think Neve modes of uh, information security and privacy management and things like that will uh, become, uh, there's a huge opportunity and I think we'll see more of that. Uh, but there's a whole trusted cyber inf infrastructure center, for instance, attacking problems from different perspectives there because it's not just one thing it's the data it's the network it's the computing it's the application and i see another that i can couple to this discussion on the chat and there's the artifacts artifacts aren't just software or data or containers or there's all these different artifacts and when i mentioned data lifecycle management and that's running across that spectrum it's really that it's that running the artifacts and saving and measure, um, looking for the life cycle of the artifacts in a way that actually maintains its sustainability, its quality, uh, its backwards compatibility. There's all these things that we need to pay attention to. And it become more and more important when you start coupling things because you can do it, maybe imagine doing it for one thing. But you know, even if you couple two things with uncertainty, <laughs> And you have more uncertainty, but can we measure that? And when is it not that we should start not coupling things? You know, what's that metric for integration and the integrated application? And that's what I call the PPODS methodology. I didn't talk a lot about it because I wanted to focus on the general picture, but we are looking at that integration metrics and trying to formalize some of those. So the integrated application conforms to the overall scientificness. So you may have addressed this, but Luca Capaletti asks, or says, thank you for your presentation. One aspect that I believe to be important that seems to be missing amongst the mentioned important points is the maintenance of the source code quality, like test coverage, for instance, while extending the data sets that one may want to ingest as input for the system. One automated solution, for instance, is fuzzing, hung mm -hmm. fuzz, AF AFL, et cetera. What's your opinion on the maintenance of the quality in code bases? So the code bases itself, there's, I think, this sustainable. <laughs> okay, not even, I'm gonna, okay, that's good. Uh, at the code level, I think there's already the challenges that we all face, right? That's the individual code and how do we maintain it over time. But then there is the integration of that code with another thing and another code to couple them together, as I mentioned before. And then you're dealing with two code bases. And that is actually an exploratory sometimes. You know, it could be a Jupyter notebook that's evolving <sighs> over time. How do you enable 
one team member to work on a Jupyter notebook and know that it can integrate with the rest of the picture, rest of the workflow. You need to come up with some integration metrics there on its accuracy, on its performance, you know, different things. But we need to then learn to build also these notebooks in a way that decouples different parts of the process. So we know, like, if it's a neural network, what part of it that we need to work on exploratively, and like how when it when you tune it, what are you tuning it for? What to, what will you integrate that output into? So then it becomes an environment that keeps track of it. And you know when you're done because you met the metric. Can we then create that test-driven development environment for the whole team to work with? So that's what we are working on as the Peapods Lab. And right now, the most practical application of it is coupling different notebooks together. But can we then build it in a way that we can formalize the whole process. Uh, of course, it doesn't take the challenges away from managing the individual code base. Is it the GitLab? And you know, when we manage that code base, you know, why are we keeping that code even? Because it conforms to some application and metric that we built it for. Then we know what to keep, keep and what's important maybe for that to work and what not to anymore. So that could be used even to maintain individual code in the long term. So, it's... so thank you, but maybe one last question from Ellen Young. Is there a phase stage of development to production uh, that can model separate from the supercomputer dependency? I wanna say yes, because but it requires a lot of research, right? Because how do you not couple if big supercomputing applications that's optimized for an environment to that supercomputer? You know, I think supercomputer centers have different ways of evolving and managing applications. So that's definitely one part of it. But can we then create a set of performance indicators? about these uh, models, right? Uh, so that over time, we can create mappings of resources, dynamically available pools of resources to uh, things that we wanna run on them. We know, you know, that's the intelligence we wanna build into this, right? Because we know about their response to data maybe over time. We know about their response to changing architectures and we can make that transition a lot more accelerated, if not seamless. So thank you. And thank you again, LK, for giving this um, great seminar talk and to all of our audience here. I, I hope that you stay safe from both COVID and wildfires. And we really thank appreciate the, the work that you're doing. Thank you, and thanks for all the great questions. It's always great to see and respond to the questions. Thank you so much. Take care. <laughs>